Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. It's a little crowded in the office today, so I'm shooting from the Kauai Room. Uh, we have a number of themed conference rooms here. I usually shoot from the bowling room, uh, but that's Occupado right now. So here I am again in the Kauai Room. But the change of setting actually makes sense, as today we have a specially themed episode. And that's all about the Hollywood suits, the business people that run the studios. Or as some creatives would say, run them into the ground. So three stories uh, that are focusing all on decisions made by the suits that run the studio system. So the first story is about Avatar. Now of course one Avatar film has come out but we keep hearing about the three more that are slated to hit theaters someday. Uh, but I think that they're being very careful because they have a unique situation here. It's where Avatar was a huge hit, an Oscar contender, uh, the most successful movie of all time, but the audiences I think really have a love-hate relationship with it. And I think there must be some concern at Fox and with James Cameron and his producers that they won't, you know, lightning won't strike twice. They don't have a perfect storm here. And, you know, it would be horrible for the, you know, the follow-up films to not only not come close to the gross of the original, but, you know, to not come close at all. So we'll see what happens. Although I do think that uh, uh, Rick Jaffa and Amanda Silver, who write the Apes films, or wrote the first two Apes films at least, Rise and Dawn, uh, having them come on board is a really great uh, sign for things going forward, but uh, the, what we're talking about today though with Avatar is technology and how important that is to the franchise. Now I think everybody would agree that one of the reasons that Avatar did so well at the box office was because many people walked away saying it was the best use of 3D ever. So you had a situation where people were coming not just because the film was doing so well and there was that curiosity factor, but people loved the 3D. They heard, oh, if you've never seen a 3D movie, this is the one you need to see it in. It's 3D margins, super high. Uh, and also people seeing it multiple times in 3D because they felt like they actually were on the planet Pandora. Uh, the film came out, you know, as you might recall, for award season during the holiday, so it was cold in a lot of parts of the world, and people said they loved spending uh, their cold winter season on this tropical, lush, alien planet. So I think that the producers feel, well, if we want to have if we want to have lightning strike twice, we need to duplicate the exact scenario. And part of that scenario was something that's really amazing with special effects. Now, they can't really go back to the 3D well, because not only have they tapped it, but I think that once gravity came in there, and also, by the way, I think got a lot of success from its technological achievements. You know, even some of the, re of the reviews that were qualified as positive on Rotten Tomatoes said outright, hey, the story's not so great, it's a little cliche, but this technology is so amazing. Uh, and so much progress is made in that regard that it's a good film. So that helped Gravity a lot. So I think you really can't return to that for a third time, at least to the degree that the second Avatar needs to. It needs to be one of the highest grossing films of all time. So they found some new technology that looks like they're thinking of incorporating. So I want to know if you think this is a good idea. It's something called 4K 3D, which is basically showing something at 120 frames per second. I think it's 60 frames per eye. Uh, now, of course, 48 frames per second that Peter Jackson exper experimented with for The Hobbit didn't really work out. He shot the whole trilogy in it because you shoot it once, uh, uh, one time, he shot it all at once. But as you might recall, uh, I don't even know if the second film was released in 48 frames per second. A lot of people didn't have a good reaction to an unexpected journey in that format. They felt that it um, was too much like watching video, a video feed from the set. It lost that um, that feel of watching a movie, that fantasy feel. It just felt like you were sitting on the set next to Peter Jackson as these characters acted out, uh, these actors uh, acted out their characters. You know, it, it, was a, it was a real problem for the film. And 48 frames per second has kind of just been jettisoned from the Hobbit trilogy. You don't hear about it at all, even if they are releasing uh, films in the 48 frames per second format. But 120, they're saying, is even better. Now, what could be better than feeling like you're actually on set, like like video feed, right? Well, they claim, and I, I, I'll give you a link to this article about this. It's very interesting. It's claimed by those who've experienced 4K 3D that it's like looking through a window. At this rate, and with the 3D aspect uh, added on, you lose 
the, the wall that's put up by the idea of watching something that's on film. It doesn't feel like it's projected. It doesn't feel like it's video. It doesn't feel like it's film. It doesn't feel like there's a screen there. It feels like you could reach through and actually be there. And of course, for a franchise where people love being on, pa on Pandora, and you might remember the tragic news story that some people were committing suicide because they couldn't go to Pandora, the idea of creating a literal window to that world could be the technological, uh, you know, ace up its sleeve that the Avatar franchise needs to move forward. So I'm curious, do you think this is possible? Do you even believe this has been achieved? Is it too creepy to you? Do you like having a little bit of a separation from what you're watching? And do you think that Avatar does need a strong technological hook to get audiences into the theater? All right, so that's the first story of the day. Now, the second story of the day is David Fincher's doing a lot of publicity for Gone Girl. Uh, and he decided to have some choice words for 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, a project he was going to do at Disney. It was going to be another big blockbuster for them, like Pirates or uh, you know, Maleficent or uh, Lone Ranger was supposed to be. David Fincher was going to come in and do that for 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Didn't work out. They're still trying to move forward with that project, although they were going to shoot in Australia. They had a lot of tax credits, and as you might have heard, they're trying to slate Pirates 5 to take that spot instead. So Disney hasn't given up on 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and neither did David Fincher, he said. He said he gave up on the idea of working with Disney at that level. Fincher said, blockbuster filmmaking is simply not for me. And I think it's an interesting situation, and I feel Fincher really kind of quit and should have stuck it out. So I'm going to explain the scenario to you, and then you can decide on what kind of advice you would have given Fincher at the time. So David Fincher actually got Disney to approve a script where he did, as he's calling it, Osama bin Nemo, where he turned uh, Captain Nemo into a terrorist, and he wanted to present children with the scenario of, okay, I see where this character is coming from, what's been done to him is horrible, but his actions, the way he goes about it, are wrong. I think that's a really tricky, uh, very thin line to walk, even with adult audiences, uh, much less uh, you know, young audiences, child audiences, where their parents are the gatekeepers. I think that's something that a lot of parents probably wouldn't even want introduced to children. So I question Disney's green lighting of that treatment of it. But Fincher got it. He got away with it. But then where he really ran into trouble was just that everybody looking over his shoulder with a $200 million budget, although it's $200 million, of course they're going to look over your shoulder. And then what really got him was the casting. He said that, you know, they would only accept certain actors, uh, and then even once he got for, past his, you know, two leads, he was saying he didn't like having discussions like, well, who's going to play in Japan? Now, I would like to point out that Michael Bay is certainly not complaining about this but because of the strength of Transformers uh, Age of Extinction, a.k.a. Transformers 4 in China. It is the highest grossing film of the year. You're seeing a lot of quotes about that being Guardians of the Galaxy. That's domestically. Worldwide, it's still Transformers. Guardians is actually number seven if you watched uh, Movie Math this week. Still, Guardians, I'm sure, will go higher, but still, uh, I don't think it's going to catch up to Transformers. And that's all thanks to the Asia box office. Frozen, another film which wouldn't have made as much money if not for its immense appeal in the Asian, you know, box office, you know, South Korea, Japan, China. That's the trinity, the holy trinity of Asia's box office uh, riches. So there's no problem, I think, with wanting to have your movie appeal to Japan. So I would like to point out some other people who've navigated the studio system with success. There's Johnny Depp. Now, some would say that the studio system and blockbusters have ruined him. And you might have something of an argument there. But there's no denying he did a great job with Jack Sparrow. And he fought the studio, you know, tooth and nail to portray this character. They were like, why is he so effeminate? And he's like, he just is. I think the great, the, the perfect line, I think actually the way he said it was, they said, is Jack Sparrow gay? Uh, you know, and then he was like, aren't all pirates gay? And, you know, he just really, you know, he, it was a mix of, uh, you know, kind of being a little combative and obtuse, being like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I think that was really clever. For instance, he talked about the fact that he put in almost all gold teeth so that he could negotiate with Disney to down to just a few. Very clever thinking ahead. And, you know, maybe David Fincher, you know, just wasn't prepared to play that game or didn't want to play it. But Depp did to great effect and great results to not only audiences but himself. You know, he's become a very rich and successful man off of the Pirates franchise. Then also there's Christopher Nolan incredibly successful and was able to navigate the studio system, not just in the Batman movies, but even in Inception, in the upcoming Interstellar. 
he's been able to do it. And Legendary allows a lot of creatives. And you might say, well, maybe then Disney's just the problem. But again, there's Pirates did quite well. Maleficent, I think, is you know has a few flaws, but it's overall what they allowed Angelina Jolie to do there uh, was really amazing. And the change of me uh, message in both Frozen and Maleficent, a very girl-friendly message, even potentially off-putting to men to the point where I'm a little concerned about it, and I think Disney should be too, but they were still willing to go there. I think that's very interesting. And so Disney has shown a willingness to you know, to cooperate. So I think Fincher should have stuck it out. But you know what? It this also points out how movies are changing, uh, you know, and what's going on there. They are a blockbuster business. They're now a global business. And if someone really wants to just focus on, you know, storytelling, for instance, uh, you know, just the craft and not think of all the business concerns that go hand in hand with such an expensive venture with so much riding on it, then that's where everyone's going to TV. And that's where Fincher, interestingly, is going. Uh, he's going to television with uh, Utopia, a project with Gone Girl's Jillian Flynn. She's the writer of Gone Girl and also got to write the script. They're working on this show for HBO uh, about a group of fans of a cult graphic novel. So he's going to TV. He already had some success with House of Cards. Maybe TV is the right place for him right now because not only did he have this problem with Disney over 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, but he had a lot of problems with Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, never reached the kind of success financially or critically that I'm sure they had hoped. And then also, I think, Gone Girl. Gone Girl, it's on people's radar, but it's no fox catcher. It's no imitation game. It's not even a whiplash. Those movies, I think, have more buzz when it comes to the Oscar race than Gone Girl. I think people are more interested in Gone Girl because it's a David Fincher movie, uh, his fan base there, and also to see how Ben Affleck does. But, you know, I'm not seeing a lot of traction for that film. We'll see what happens when it actually hits theaters, but, you know, how it exists in terms of the public relations realm, it's not very strong. All right, so that's the second story of the day. The third story is that our old pal Jeff Robinov has found a home. He's the former head of Warner Brothers. He was uh, he half quit, half was forced out by Kevin Sujihara over at Warner Brothers when Kevin Sujihara got the gig to lead the studio and not Robinov. And there was some concern as to what Robinov would do and how Warner Brothers would do without him. And they're having some problems and they're still benefiting from films that he put into development. It's similar to what happened with Disney with Dick Cook, although Disney I think is safely rebounded at this point. But very interesting to see what happens to the slate of films when they have changes in the, with the suits. Uh, so Dick Cook, very interesting story. I'd go back and check that out and all the stuff that happened with him. Uh, but then now we're talking about Robinov today. So Jeff Robinov, he has wound up at Sony, which could use the help. You know, their Spider-Man uh, franchise is uh, really having a difficult time. Maybe they could ask Jeff for his advice on that. And his company, his production jingle is called Studio 8. And it's going to have its offices on the Sony lot, I believe, in Culver City. Now, you don't have to have your offices on the studio lot, uh, but you can have a, a, a deal where they'll pay for your offices off the lot or, you know, contribute to that expense. But I think that still today people like to have a, uh, an office on the lot when they can. There's some prestige to it. And if you're going to have a studio deal uh, where they distribute your films or get first crack to distribute them, why not be there so, you know, you're really part of the home team. It's a good show of solidarity. But also, Robinov has got all of his financing, a billion dollars worth. He got a billion dollars because he's going to self-finance all of his films while well, he's doing films, TV, and digital, the whole spectrum. But he got it from China. And so this is another situation where that money came with the string attached to it that the properties that Robinov does in all of these different fields must incorporate Chinese elements. So I think that's very interesting. But hey, if someone's going to give you a billion dollars, I'm sure you'd be happy to accommodate them, especially considering, again, how much money there is to be had over in the Asian box office. So Robinov is moving forward, and I think it's very interesting to see what he'll do here and how Warner Brothers will do without him. Of course, he did a wonderful job of uh, building relationships at Warner Brothers. Uh, of course, Nolan, Affleck, Snyder, they were all his. Uh, Baz Luhrmann he brought in with Gatsby. He's the one who was behind the Lego movie. Uh, the Batman trilogy, of course, Harry Potter, uh, you know, Nolan's trilogy. Just so much talent across the board. Let me just see if I missed anybody, because it really is an impressive list. Oh, yes, David Heyman, the producer of the Harry Potter films. And then also that led to Warner Brothers getting gravity with, again, Alfonso Cuaron and establishing a really strong relationship there. So I'll be very curious to see which of these talents maybe go over to Robinov over at Sony. Very interesting. Pay attention to that space. I think he's a really talented, uh, you know, studio suit and producer and businessman. Uh, and I'm, as I said before, whenever I did a Warner Brothers red carpet when he was at the studio, he always stopped and did an interview, which I always appreciated. And in some cases, it saved the piece because I was in a spot where it was hard to get anybody. So I love Jeff Robinov. I think he's a great guy. I like him personally, and I like what he does professionally. All right, so let's move on to the viewer 
question. This is a very interesting one, and it, it speaks to what all these suits are trying to do, and that's create a classic film. This comes from, uh, or just actually a profitable film, but I don't think studio suits are as evil as uh, some people like to believe. Uh, but let's discuss this. All right, Andre Becerra. And Andre says, hey, Grace, question. What do you think makes a film a classic? Many of the films mentioned in the viewer question, this was the other day about uh, soundtracks, uh, scores for films, uh, like Jaws, Blade Runner, or maybe even Speed are classics. So what do you think are the main aspects of a movie that factor into making it a classic within its own genre? Is it the film score? Is it the movie stars? A strong script? Relatable characters? Groundbreaking special effects like Avatar or Gravity? Cultural uh, resonance? Uh, do the factors uh, vary depending on the genre, maybe? Let me know what you think, and I'd love it if you could give a shout out to all the viewers in Peru and Latin America, of course. Hi, Peru and Latin America. I hope you're having a great day. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, you have a friend and Andre. Uh, and then also, uh, he says, thanks, and keep up the excellent work to Smiley Faces. And also, a smiley face with a D, which is a super smiley face. All right, Andre, great question. I think that what makes a classic film is when all of those elements come together. A classic film, and you forget, also, I wouldn't forget heart, a real emotional pull. That's what makes a classic film, when everything comes together perfectly, when a movie is firing on all cylinders. And for an example, let's use Speed. I like that you brought that up, and I think it's something you wouldn't expect to be a classic film, but I really do think that it, it is. I think Speed is very highly regarded, and it has a lot of um, resonance through the years, whereas you might wonder, well, why, doesn't, why don't other action, actioners have the same kind of staying power as Speed? Well, a couple of reasons. First, let's talk about uh, the cast, all right? There's Keanu Reeves. Before that, he'd really only made Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and Point Break. He was on his way up, but this was the movie that made him a star. So I think it has some, you know, significance in that regard. That contributes to it being a classic film, the film that finally cemented Keanu's place on the Hollywood map. Then, this is the movie that introduced Sandra Bullock to audiences. She had a few, she'd had a few roles before as well, but this is the movie that made her a star. So you have a movie that's right away well known for not only two great performances, but two star-making performances. So that's really good. Then there's also the scale. A lot of times we'll talk about a movie seeming small. Uh, I think for the way a movie can do really well in theaters and really connect with audiences is when it, it, acts, it treats itself with respect. It doesn't, you know, cut the budget to the point where you can see it on the screen. It feels like something for the ages. You know, it has that instantly classic feel to it. And I think speed has a big scale to it. You know, I, I think that it's, it's exciting and it's action-packed. It's a little bit like Die Hard to that degree. Another classic action film. So, and just a classic film in general. So there's the scale of it. Then also high concept. High concept really contributes a lot to a film being a classic. And the high concept means that you can really easily say what it's about. It's like a one sentence. Uh, it's an easy elevator pitch. You know, speed. If a bus goes less than 50 miles per hour, it will blow up. And it has to be stopped by uh, this really, this, this police detective and this woman who happens to be riding the bus. And oh, she's a bad driver. Her license has been suspended. Not only is it a simple concept, but it's a clever concept. Everything just comes, comes together really well. So I think that's one of the things that contributed to Speed being such a big success in a, in a classic film. Really intelligent, simple, yet smart script. And there's also the relatable, uh, relatability factor. A lot of us, almost all of us, have been on the bus. We know what it's like, and we can imagine ourselves in that situation. Again, I'm going to reference Die Hard. We can all imagine what it would be like to be in that office building. Even something like Titanic. We can, that movie made us feel like what it would have been like to be on the boat. So there's that aspect as well. So that's what I would say. And, you know, of course, the soundtrack helps as well. It's just everything coming together. And I think that's why there are lots of good movies that are made, but the ones that stand the test of time are the ones that are almost flawless. And they really, you know, they have great cinematography, they have great music, great performances, they have a great story, a message, heart, everything has to be there. And I think that when you think about the films that stick around, uh, even the ones that become classics later, classics later on, even though they're not really well realized at first, for instance, Blade Runner, not a huge success out of the gate, that's because they have all these elements. So, thank, and also, you know, turning points in uh, you know, the genre and history, either from being a star-making turn or a message, etc. So thank you so much for your question, Andre. Again, hello to you in Peru and everyone else in Latin America, and hello to all the BTT viewers. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please write down below what you think of today's top three stories, the viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.